as an artist manager, like my background, it doesn't make sense to tell my artist to be filming every second of every day. Um, so like, yeah, I want to say post three to seven times a day, but that's just not where I want you to spend. If you have time to do that, I'd rather you be in the writing room writing a hit song because guess what? If you have a hit song, it's going to work on TikTok. I don't care how many times you post, right? Like figure out your art form, not like how much you should post on TikTok because if you have music that isn't great, that isn't compelling, it's just not going to work no matter if you post a hundred times a day. Yeah. So yeah. my priority, like if I'm explaining it to artists, you've got to prioritize your time as CEO of your business. Mm. Do you have the most compelling stuff that's going to work? Is it timely? I'm not saying if it's not great. I'm sure you think your music is great, but is it timely as well? Is this the time for that music? Do you have an opportunity for it? That's what you need to look at. So what is the cadence? What you feel comfortable with? But if I had to put a number on it, like you need to be posting every other day. That's probably probably the cadence. If you can do a little bit more than that, that's great too. What's going on? Welcome to the new music business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book. Third edition is out now everywhere. It's a new one. It's on audiobook. There's the Kindle version. There's the hardcover. However you like to consume books, it is out for you. Today, my guest is Johnny Clority. He is the CEO and founder of Songfluencer. They are kind of a, a music marketing company that focuses on TikTok. Now, Johnny's been in the industry for a little while. He started at WME, uh, William Morris Endeavors, as an agent uh, in Nashville. Then he was an artist manager at Triple Eight Management. Um, so he's worked, you know, on that side as well, and then started Songfluencer in 2018 and uh, kind of started doing YouTube influencer marketing. And then when TikTok came out, all in on TikTok. And so we talk about kind of uh, how influencer marketing has evolved. And a lot of this conversation is where is TikTok right now in 2023? Uh, you know, over half the year done of 2023 and what's going on in the space and is it as powerful as it as it ever was and how are artists using it right now effectively? And um, we talk about, you know, when people don't really want to use it, what is his response to them? Songfluence is interesting. They've acquired um, a couple different TikTok companies, I guess, uh, in the last year or so. Uh, Yo Suzy and Prefi are, are two of them, which I actually saw the founders of those two companies speak at the Music Biz Conference in Nashville, which which formed me of Songfluencer. And this is why I initially got in touch to kind of learn a little bit more on how they're making it work. Now, Songfluencer and Johnny has worked with virtually every major label out there. So, you know, I, I talk to artists a lot when they're, they're kind of like, you know, oh, I just need to get signed. I just need a label to help me. It's like, well, you know what? It's funny right now is the labels, we all have the same tools and there's no like secret magic levers that the labels are pulling right now behind the scenes. They're hiring companies like Songfluencer or like Flight House, who was on uh, the podcast uh, last year, or like Vertical, who I also had uh, Griffin from Vertical on the podcast as well, or any of these other TikTok influencer marketing agencies out there. Now, TikTok influencer marketing has evolved quite a lot in the last two to three years. And uh, we talk about this uh, on this episode episode. So if you're wondering how to use TikTok right now, definitely this is the episode for you. But also if you're wondering how music marketing has evolved and where we're at just in general, even if you hate TikTok, I would encourage you to listen to this episode because we we even talk about Johnny gave some really great ideas for people uh, that don't want to use TikTok and how to market their music right now, especially to the mass audience. You can find all of us that make the show happen at Ari's Take on TikTok, of course and Instagram. You can find me at Ari Herstand on Instagram. Visit ariestake.com. Get on the email list. That's where you're going to find the most up-to-date information about the new music business that we send out, new episodes, all that stuff. Get on the email list. But Pause the show right now. However you're listening to this, hit the subscribe button, hit the follow button, hit the thumbs up. And uh, if you want us in your feed and leave us a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. If you listen to a few and you haven't left a review, that'd be awesome if you left one and comment on YouTube. If you're listening or watching this on YouTube, I like reading the comments. All right, well, let's kick into the show. Johnny, Clarity, welcome to the show. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
So uh, I'm I'm really excited to to chat with you today because you know um, I when I was at Music Biz the conference in Nashville um, last month a couple months ago whenever that was oh, um, we didn't May right yeah so um, you know we didn't get to connect but I saw uh, a couple panels of some of the uh, the companies the leaders of the companies that you've recently acquired. Uh, like Yo Suzy and like Preffy. And it got me thinking about like how the landscape of influencer marketing, short form video content, TikTok influencer marketing, all of that has evolved over the years. And because now you've been leading Songfluencer for some time now, I'm curious just from your vantage point, just Give me kind of the landscape of where we're at as an industry. And if you want to give me a little history on uh, where we're at as an industry, a music industry, but also kind of like marketing, I guess, which is, you know, uh, something that you spend a lot of your time doing. Uh, I'd love for you to just kind of open with that. Yeah, man. Um, there, there's so much to be said about like where we are, where we have been. Um, yeah. I, I'm a little bit of salt of the earth on this question. So in my opinion right now, like where we are in influencer or, or where we are in music marketing has been sure. where we've always been. Like it's, we're trying to hit the masses. We're trying to get our music out there. Uh, there's some kind of weird gatekeeper situation, right? Like if you ask someone 30 years ago, they were like radio, radio, radio. How right. do I do? That? Well, the labels have this and I have to be, sign a major label and I've got to figure this thing out. Then came this thing, Spotify. And now I got to build these relationships with these gatekeepers and I got to figure this out. And like, now it's this thing. So, um, you know, music promotion has always been kind of a hard nut to crack. It's always been a interesting space. Uh, but, you know, one of the big differentiators that we are in right now in, in terms of the music industry is the... the the gatekeepers are becoming exponentially larger and which makes the fewer gatekeepers less powerful or impactful, mm. which I think is very, in my opinion, as someone who loves music, I think it really just gives everyone a little bit more of a fair shake. Uh, what do you mean a, the gatekeepers are, are becoming larger? Give me an example of what a larger gatekeeper is. There's, there's more volume of gatekeepers. There's more. Oh, got more it. Okay. Okay. And not just, you know, not like 30, the big three major labels or whatever, like you're talking about, or yeah, it's not or, like Clear Channel what runs right, all the radio the, stations. Okay. The the fifty reporting stations, you know, like if right. you if you impress five of them, you get the you get another twenty to go, right? And that's that Got was it. the game of music promotion for the last hundred years, right? Like uh, yes. that's what it was, and now it's like it's not as clear. There's not like a there's not a path, you mm, know, right. and and I think it's a good thing. I think it's frustrating. I mean, I don't. You know, I definitely I'm not an artist. I'm not a musician, you know, yeah. but I can only imagine in this current world right now for any independent artist, it's got to be infuriating, frustrating. <laughs> it's like, where do I start? What do I do? Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's, you know, it's rough. But yeah. uh, influencer marketing has been around now for, you know, I started doing influencer marketing when I was an artist manager. And primarily it was like YouTube cover artists. That kind of thing is how I started. <laughs> Got but it. really, I think the world of influencer marketing in the music space started like right when TikTok hit the scene. Like it mm. wasn't that big, right. not what it is today until TikTok came on and we saw what like it did for Old Town Road. Like I know that's yes. so cliche, but that was where we were like, whoa, how do we get that moment? And the only way to really do that is influencers. So do you think it do you think that it really exploded because you didn't need uh, eight hundreds of thousands of dollars or, or millions of dollars uh, for a marketing campaign because in the previous era of influencer marketing and the Instagram era, not even going back as far as YouTube, it was like it depend it the only real influencers were the ones that had millions of followers and you had to pay a lot of money for them, which kind of elbowed out or excluded uh virtually all the indie labels, most of the artists and everything. And the majors were participating in this, but only for the artists that they were willing to invest the hundreds of thousands of dollars in marketing and specifically just in that. Um, or 
like why do you think or or was it just you just weren't seeing it happen in that era i mean you know we all remember the fire festival that was you know i think that was the apex of what like uh influencer marketing could or was at that time um mm -hmm. and and how that you know finished up but yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, it's it's definitely a mixed bag i think you you mentioned a lot of things that i could probably say yes to that yes to that but I, I think primarily if I had to say one thing to kind of answer that, I, yeah. I think it's technology. Like I think mm. short form video okay. created a, a space where creators had to put music on their piece of content and sure. had to film something and put a soundtrack to their content. So I think just technologically speaking of like yep. advancement of content creation is like music hit that intersection really hard when TikTok came about. And I just think that was the biggest reason. I'm not saying it's the only reason. It's just sure. probably the biggest reason. Cool. Um, well, that makes sense. So so now let's fast forward or let's just start there, I suppose, of, you know, Old Town Road that catches 2019 or so into 2020, I guess, is when we really started to see the explosion of songs catching on TikTok, uh, these viral moments that are happening, um, is that when you really started to kind of get into, I guess, influencer marketing is around that time of, of like this TikTok explosion? We were doing influencer marketing on YouTube in 2018. Old mm. Town Road was actually dropped in November or December of 2018. Oh, I okay. Wanna, I want to say November. Okay. Uh, and a little bit before that, we started to test Musical.ly campaigns anyway, because we were trying to figure that out. There, It was cool, but it didn't have the impact. It was hard. Like, they didn't have the virality that TikTok, like, obviously now has. So it didn't do anything for the songs. Yeah. When did like, Musical.ly switch to TikTok? It was, like, November or October of 2018. So, like... Oh, okay. So, like, Old Town Road was, like, the first the one. <laughs> right, right, yeah, right when TikTok movie. launched. Got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. you know, because they were able to, like, infuse Musical.ly with all of their, you know, user base across the globe. Sure. Had big budgets to market it. Got a bunch of users. But, yeah, we were doing it right there. And I remember, okay. you know... Uh, I, I remember sitting in my co-founder's kitchen. We were like trying to figure it out. And we get a call from an A and R guy, and he's like, "What do you know about TikTok?" He's like, "I got this." <laughs> like, I was like, "He's like, yeah. I could cash app you some money right now to give me some yeah. TikTok." I was, like, I was yeah. like, "Dude, I have no idea how to do this, but I'll give it a shot." And uh, okay, yeah. so we've been doing it. You know, this summer, Songfluencer will be five years old. Amazing, and yeah. um. I, I, you know, I don't want to get into the laundry list of everyone you've worked for, but I believe I read somewhere that you worked with virtually every major label in some capacity on a campaign. Is that accurate? Yeah, I can't. T it's def we've worked with almost every label. Like, there's yeah. probably someone out there that could be like, oh, I don't think you, you know, maybe in some weird territory somewhere. But sure, domestic U.S. like every imprint, every major we've touched in some capacity. Yes. So, you know, I've had people on this show in the past um, that have discussed influencer marketing as it was in like 2020, 2021, namely uh, for people listening to this, I would encourage you to, to go listen to the episode with Griffin Hadrill, uh, who runs Vertical, uh, mm -hmm. listen to the episode uh, with Austin Georges from Flight House. Uh, of, you know, we went deep into what influencer marketing was then. I don't need to give the whole history and I don't want to necessarily get into the history with you of where we've come, uh, you know, 2020, 2021, which more or less seemed like the glory days of TikTok influencer marketing. I'm curious where we're at now getting into July 2023, because I, what I've heard is like uh, I've heard people say TikTok's over. It's, uh, you know, we're not influencer marketing is not what, what it was two years ago. It's not where it's at. It's not happening anymore. Um, and songs aren't really going viral as often on TikTok. What is your response to that? And what is your strategy right now for how you run your company? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the platform has matured. Speaking about TikTok, the platform has matured over the last few years and they've kind of changed things that their algorithm supports or doesn't support. Um, 
And primarily they've rewarded more creators that are coming out with very compelling content and not just like the teeny bopper dances like they used to. Right. Sure. And, I, and I think like, you know, before the call, like we talked about Charlie D'Amelio, for instance, like there's a reason Charlie doesn't post every single day or three times a day on the platform like she used to, because it's just not as rewarding because the platform isn't supporting those things anymore. Right. Uh, so like one, as a company, you know, we've really done a lot of things to, to adapt to that. And I think, you know, early on, it was all about hiring pretty much like the same 75 to hundred creators, you know, mm. the, the Charlie's, the Addison's, the Noah Beck's, the, you know, the hype house kids, whatever, like that was the game for like a year. And now sure. it's like, you got to be very specific. You have to be very, um, trend oriented. Mm. Uh, you have to be very like, understand like the cultural zeitgeist and it's not just about like hiring the biggest baddest creator for the lowest amount of money possible which is kind of mm. what it used to be uh, because even getting a lot of like impressions or views on an influencer like that's not going to make or break you it's really about intentionality of um finding the right community um the the struggle for the music space and me coming from a music background as an artist manager Mm -hmm. The struggle is to, a lot of people assume that if I hire influencers or creators that meet my artist's fan base, that means I'm going to have success. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't really connect as much as artist marketers would like them to. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that's maybe that's how things have worked in like formats in the past, right? Like if you have a pop record, you want to find female or like if you're a female pop artist, you want to find like females with like pink hair and look cool and are wearing, you know, whatever, like wearing the sure. style, right? It, it doesn't always work like that on TikTok. <laughs> like mm. you, could, you can have really weird things, really weird demographics. And it's more about creating trends and going in that direction, not challenges. I think those days are over, like not that kind of stuff, but I just think it's like right now we're in this space where you have to attach your song to something that the people want to do for the next two to three weeks. Like you have well, to. There. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. I want to, I want to talk about this um, going after demographics for a moment because um, I, yeah, that's what I would have thought. Honestly, I, I would think, you know, because if we zoom out and we're like, what's the point of all this? <laughs> like, let's just like, let's talk about like, why does anybody do any of this? And I would imagine uh, when we're talking about artists, specifically we can label i uh, will talk labels later but like artists specifically why do they want to do this well they want to get more fans period you know they want to get more streams sure that's why labels do it but they really want more fans they want people to listen to the music buy tickets to their concerts follow them for life so you know to that extent that's where I would imagine, yes, you'd want to work with creators that have an audience that you think would like your music. It doesn't, I guess, doesn't make a lot of sense to me to work with, a, like, to target an audience that wouldn't like my music or wouldn't want to be a fan of mine. So ex explain that a little bit more. Yeah, um, it's, so if you if you reverse engineer it, right, like, okay. the, the, the goal the goal is consumption on DSPs, Spotify, YouTube, whatever it might be. Yeah. So that is the ultimate goal. And we know that success on these platforms like TikTok inspires consumption on these platforms. We don't know why sometimes it doesn't. We know that it does to an extreme point at, a, at many different times, but we know that's the goal. Well, how TikTok works is one person talks about or one person uses audio or a song in their piece of content. Mm -hmm. Say that that user has 10,000 people that see that content that features Ari's music in it. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe let's say 1% of those people go to Spotify because of that. That's cool. And that's kind of what you want. But yeah. really, the goal is to hire or to activate or to partner with a number of creators that are not only going to get their 1% to go to Spotify, but get their 1% to create videos 
using Ari's music yes. and then 1% of those people and then 1% of those people and then 1% of those people to not just go to Spotify, but also to create a video using Ari's music. Because if you, if you think about that from an exponential standpoint, then yeah. you have real critical mass and you also have like this snowball effect that just doesn't stop. Um, mm. And that's where we get streaming. And so going back to like your question, like, okay, I thought it was just hiring the creators that meet my artist brand, like my yeah. vibe. Well, sometimes if you're a cool, like vibey hipster folk band, cool vibey hipster folk people don't film TikToks, right? Like it's just <laughs> not a thing for right. you, bro. Yeah. But that yeah. doesn't mean like, I've always said for the longest time, if someone created a song that was that in the chorus had some kind of inflection point that was like, man, this cornbread is slap your mama good. Yeah. Like that would be so funny on TikTok. Yeah. And you don't need to hire or activate or partner with like folky, cool, hipster folk people. Like that's not a thing on TikTok. Like you have to get in the creator zeitgeist in order for your song to be replicated. Well, okay. So I, I get that. Um, and, and that's when we saw these viral moments happening in 2020, 2021, even, you know, uh, 2022 a little bit um, from what I was, uh, my understanding was, um, and and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm definitely not the expert on this, and I don't, I don't, you know, spend my days studying the trends or what's happening on TikTok. Um, is I had thought that where we're at now is that it's a lot more um, fragmented in that we're not seeing as many songs go massively viral turning into top 10 billboard hits like we used to it's we're seeing it fragmented so instead of you know 20 songs go you know going insanely viral with with hundreds of thousands of video creations um on tiktok like you're talking about the one percent of the one percent they create the videos which then inspires people to go listen to the song on spotify which uh, streaming sort of dsps which then gets them to chart, we might now see 50 songs that don't go insanely viral, but get a little bit of traction in various communities that does move the needle a little bit, but not to the extent of it charting like it used to. And the fragmentation is a little bit more targeted to a subset and a smaller community, maybe? Or am I way off base? No, man, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, okay. the platform, you know, there there was a cool uh, chart that uh, my buddy Yoav, who owns a company called Trendpop, it's like a short form music analytics platform, really cool. But they came out with a graphic that was like, I just thought was so cool about how many more creators aren't like people actually creating content on platform now versus 2020. Mm -hmm. And it's just like 10 X. Wow. So if you have more, even if you have the same audience, but more videos, that just means each video is going to get less views, right? Like it's going to get sure. less engagement because sure. it's a, it's an ecosystem. So I definitely think if you look at it from the macro standpoint there, it's, it's not going to have as much of an impact across the board of like all 50 songs are not going to come from TikTok, but mm -hmm. I definitely think it's, it, it's the number one discovery platform across the board in music still. Yes. Like it may not be, it may not be there in five years. I don't sure. know, but right. music always changes. So it's, it's tough to say, but I think yeah. right now it's still the driving factor. I mean, if you talk to anyone in A&R or yeah. you know, they're still like, what do you, what's your TikTok strategy? The first yeah. thing they're going to pull up, what do you got going on on TikTok? Yeah, no. And, and, and I've seen that as well across the board. And that is honestly, um, you know, everyone's talking about it because like, it's a tool that we're using right now. And, and, you know, prior to this, I, th uh, one of the most effective things that I found, uh, was, was, uh, running ads like social media ads, like Instagram ads or whatever, which is still very effective. However, that costs a lot of money. Whereas like theoretically, you know, the, the idea here is that potentially artists can do this without spending any money, um, because they can get songs to catch or their videos to catch. And theoretically you'd, the, uh, it would be nice to happen organically, but we know that more times than not, it's not happening organically. It's happening because of companies like 
you. And so uh, let's talk about that a little bit of like, what do you do? Uh, what does Songfluencer do? And now all the uh, entities that you do, like how do you run campaigns and when does somebody come to you to uh, help th grow their presence or help achieve their goals? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So once again, I've been in this space for five years and mm -hmm. uh, Songfluencer now is a reflection of just my, I don't know, like I want to say failures or learnings, however you want to put it. Um, sure. But the the Songfluencer family basically consists of three different entities. Songfluencer, which is a music marketing creator agency. Number two is Prefi, which is a nano micro contesting platform. Mm -hmm. And then three, Yo Suzy. Um, what I noticed over the years of running Songfluencer and doing these big influencer campaigns where we're spending a bunch of money, we're hiring creators, we're doing these dance trends, is if you do that out of the gate, when you drop a song on TikTok, what happens is the posts from those influencers typically are suppressed by the algorithm. And why mm. is that? Well, the algorithm kind of says things that are in motion that are at high velocity. So a song, for instance, if a lot of people are using it and then someone uses it, we're going to reward you with engagement. That's mm. how they the algorithm is written. Whereas if no one's using a song and Johnny decides to use it, the algorithm is going to suppress that piece of content because the algorithm is saying, hey, bro, nobody likes this song. Stop huh. using it. So in years past, when we would hire these really big influencers that cost a lot of money and we'd hire them out the gate right on release day, and then we do all that. And then we're like, how come it didn't work? It's because the algorithm is not conditioned that way. And there's a lot of examples that we can see to the, still to this day where we see a small baby user influencer that has 2,000 followers. They used a viral track and they got a million views on a post. Why? Because the algorithm is saying, hey, good job. Do this. And that's how ByteDance created the, the ecosystem and their algorithm. So mm -hmm. Prefi was our answer to that. Um, it was developed and, and built by a guy named Charlie Davis, who now works for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, it doesn't make sense. It, it makes sense for us when we're releasing music or launching new music to get a lot of small people or small influencers, small users that don't have big follower counts that we don't have to pay a lot of money to, uh -huh. to use my song early on before I hire larger influencers and make a larger spend. Sure. So the whole concept here is, well, I know I need to get a lot of little people or small influencers or a lot of I need, I need traction on my song, but I shouldn't pay a lot of money. Prefi answers that because we can pay. And, and with Prefi, we're not going out there paying $2, $3, $4. We're saying, hey, here's a contest. And for a hundred bucks, you can, and if you've got to use this artist's song, you can win, right? So that's the whole concept of Prefi. And we get a lot of action that way early on. It's not massive. It's not going to not going to make or break your song. It's not going to get hundreds of millions of views, but it makes that algorithm start thinking about where this song is going it increases that momentum and so when songfluencer comes in and hires those bigger influencers that do cost mm -hmm. significant sums of money the algorithm has those kind of puts them on a t already right it sets mm -hmm. it up so that they will overperform most of the time what's the so, difference i don't quite understand how prefi from this explanation works in the sense what's the difference from hiring a um, hundred small influencers at fifty dollars a pop, saying, "Here's fifty bucks. Go create a, a video with my song in it." Doesn't that same, serve the same function? Versus what uh, Prefi? I don't. Can you explain a little bit more what yeah. what Prefi does and how that works? So the difference is is just the logistics. Like okay. for me personally, it doesn't make sense for me, or even in my opinion, an artist who should be probably like creating, writing music, to reach out to a hundred influencers talk to a hundred people, arrange yeah. payment, do all that. Instead, Prefi says, because what's a hundred times 50? That's uh, 5,000. $5,000, right? Yeah. So instead, Prefi says, hey, we've got $2,000 and we're going to give it to the best 20 posts. So then all these people start competing oh. for all that oh. money, right? So then you're not, spending, you're not spending as much because it's kind of a contest element, right? So it's a different way we play it. Um, mm. And it just, so, 
a logistics point, it makes a lot more sense. Oh, well that, yeah, I mean, shit, you're gonna get theoretically a ton of people to make videos with your song in it that you don't have to pay because yeah, exactly. they might not win. And so is this, is so so it is, is it results-based? Is, is like, do the winners, uh, how do you win? Is it based on number of views or likes or comments? Number of likes. Or, number of likes. Number of likes. And the users can post twice to combine the likes from two or three or four posts. Killer. So it it creates this competition, right? So if if yeah. you get a hundred likes on your post and I get eighty and I'm in second place, well, guess what? If I post and I can beat you, yeah. I jump you and I can get your prize. And and I can see like the the real time leaderboard somewhere, and that's yeah. kind of how this works. Cool. Yeah, okay. Refi.com. Every right. <laughs> yeah, artists, the artists see it, the influencers see it. It's right there. So that solved that problem Got or it. you know mitigated it. But the third thing, man, and I think it's the most critical, um, was our partnership with Susie Yoder. She used to be the uh, head of digital from Electra Records, was there mm -hmm. for many years. Before that, she was at Republic Records. Uh, she was a great client of mine over the years. She moved to Nashville. She didn't want to go back to New York, but she was like this like TikTok savant. Every time I talked to her, she knew more than me about TikTok trends and cool things. And I was like, we were just like, we should do something together. And the hardest thing for me over the last couple of years, I, I kept getting people that would come to me saying, Hey man, can you get on the phone with my artist for like two or three hours to tell them what to film for TikTok?" And I'm like, man, I just like, I don't like, I love you. I'll give you some time. Like I can try, but basically yeah. her passion was like helping artists with their TikTok strategy, making sure that like they created this and adopted the platform. And one of the biggest pieces that I saw over the last four or five years was that Artists were trying and still to this day try to solve their lack of TikTok success with paying influencers instead of actually adopting the platform, learning how to film content and developing a fan base. Yes. Right. You know, and so I can't tell you how many times people come to me and they're like, let's do an influencer plan. And I look at their page and I'm like, you need to hire Susie and then come talk to me later. Like, <laughs> go figure out how to compel a fan base, how to build sure. audience, how to do this thing. And then use that as the catalyst, because once again, it goes back to, I am fighting against the algorithm. So if you as the artist can be your own ambassador, your own influencer, and then you come to me with the influencer element, the algorithm is already primed. So that was the mm. third critical kind of um, business model we added to Songfluencer over the years. And I mean, she's been awesome. She's worked with legacy artists that don't even want to get on platform or struggle to. Uh, yeah. And she also works with, you know, a complete baby artists that are, you know, brand new to releasing their first songs to the world. Sure. Uh, but, you know, that's how those three elements, you know, song fluencer, Prefi and Yo Suzy kind Got of it. all work together because every artist has something different they need. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, do you think it's necessary for artists to have a presence on TikTok themselves, even if their goal is just to increase streams, uh, and couldn't that theoretically be accomplished with just a bunch of influencers using that song and they don't even have to have a TikTok profile? I mean, yeah, you could go at it that way, man, but like, it's just like, why would you not? Why would you not? Well, if you hate, if you hate posting, if you hate TikTok, it then, would, it would, yeah. But there's so many ways to still create the content that's compelling for your fans. Like use cap cut trends. Without what are cap cut trends? Yourself. Oh God, how do I? Explain what does that mean? That? Um. Oh my God. Um. So first of all, anyone can go to our website. My marketing director just posted a great article on what is cap cut. Okay. Um, but cap cut is an app that was developed by ByteDance, TikTok's parent company, that is a video editing tool that has a lot of AI features that connects really well to TikTok, but you can also use it as a video editor for other purposes as well, but it just really connects well. Okay. Um, but inside the video editor, you can do really interesting, cool things. You can add GIFs to your posts or whatever. Um, and it's a really interesting way to make memeable content for TikTok that is compelling, that'll live out there for a while. Um, it's a way for people that don't want to film real cheeky stuff or spend a lot of time 
editing to create compelling content at scale. Yeah. It's CapCut is definitely something that you have to mess with and you have to understand what it is. But for any listeners out there, if they've logged into TikTok and they've seen Michael Scott putting like his stereo up to the ceiling, that yeah. is a cap cut trend. Um, there's a the rock has one out there, like um is that a filter? Is, like let's just get I'm gonna break this down. Is this like is that what we call a filter or what is that? Two different things. I know, okay. man. It's so confusing. So right now on TikTok, there are things called, uh, so there's in-app filters, which are things right. provided by the TikTok editing platform. Then there are uh, effect house AR, augmented reality filters, where you have to go out of the app, download effect house, create a filter, launch it on a TikTok. And that is an augmented reality filter an example of that that maybe some of the listeners have seen is where it's a randomizer box above somebody's head and it's spinning like magic eight ball, like mm -hmm. tell me what age I'm going to get married, whatever that is. That's an AR filter. And then a cap cut trend, completely different, separate outside third party app that you can uh, do video editing with or you can attach these different moments to like the rock or john cena and it becomes something so mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of artists that were not even filming themselves were doing the the michael scott thing where there's a moment in the the show the office mm -hmm. where he's putting his stereo he's trying to disrupt the person that's above him by mm -hmm. putting the speaker on his stereo and standing on his desk or his chair or something and like trying to be annoying. Yeah. And a lot of artists started to use that, like me trying to tell the world about my new song or me trying oh, to do okay. this. And, it sh and it's, they weren't in it. Like the artists that I saw, all the artists that were using this cap cut trend were not actually in the footage. It was just like their album cover and Michael Scott. Right, right, right. Okay. What, okay it says so I, to the, what it says to the world is you understand TikTok artists. Yes. You're filming stuff and people are laughing and they're like, oh my God, you're so funny. Whatever. Right. And then they're like, okay, what is this song or who is this artist? And and then, you know, they lean in and, and then they, because the community, you know, there's, of course, there's a gazillion sub communities within TikTok. But at the end of the day, everyone is on TikTok in on the joke and in on this this thing of like, OK, we're all participating in this collectively. And so if I can see that the artist is also participating in, in on the joke with me, that's going to get me to kind of want to follow this artist. Now, you know, I, there are a lot of artists out there. Um, especially the ones like you were referencing before, these like, you know, more hipster, uh, you know, folky, Americana, whatever, all these genres, maybe, you know, most artists that I've spoken to that are over the age of 28, <laughs> frankly, you know, don't really want to have a TikTok strategy and don't really want to like have to do this. Um, and it's like, it's it's like pulling teeth uh, for these that I've spoken with, um, because they 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 hear that the only way to grow their music right now is TikTok, and they're like, I don't get it. I feel like I'm like playing the lottery every time I post a video. It's incredibly demoralizing because every video is like, wow. I just posted 30 videos over the last, you know, three weeks and they each got 100 views, 200 views total. And what am I supposed to do now? Hire somebody and pay them 10 grand to help me get 400 views total or what, you know, per video? Like, so what do you tell these artists if they're like, I don't know what to do. I hate this. It's really, it's not working for me. I don't understand what I'm supposed to do here what what do you say to them? Do you do you run into that in in sense? Uh, I mean, every, every day, especially okay. you know, I got to say a lot more with legacy acts. Yeah, you know, some of the you know catalog companies we work with, and we have to talk to different people. But sure, I, I think there's kind of two answers. It, it, one is kind of direct and maybe a little mean, but it's like, man, music is always the first to be disrupted by technology in general. Like when someone said, "Hey, we're not going to do." Uh, you know, we're going to do digital recording. I'm sure artists got mad about having to do multi-track recording at one point, right? People thought, oh, I'm an artist. I shouldn't do it this way. It's digital. Fuck that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I shouldn't say that. Sorry. You can swear. Uh, <laughs> you know, or, you know, different, um, you know, 
I know there's certain artists that don't want to put anything on Spotify and that's still a heavily debated thing, but like, that's where things are going. Like, I think mm -hmm. like you have to, you have to choose, like, what do you want? Where are you going? Like, you have to make that. And like the world, the world was not built for artists. We want artists in the world, but sometimes the world is moving in directions that maybe artists don't love. And like, you got to figure it out. Like you've got to figure out where you're going. And that kind of leads into point two, where I got, I've been a record guy for almost 15 years. I started as a tour manager. I've worked for agencies. I've worked as a manager. If anyone says that there's one way to make it, I just, I just stop there and I'll walk out of the room because I just don't believe that. I think yep. TikTok is the number one consumption platform for music in the world right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean like right now, go build a following on discord. You will blow up. Or go right. build a following on Roblox or go build a fault. You have to have a platform. You have to. There's sure. social social platform, digital, like that's where the world is. You, or it's like you could, I want to challenge, I bet an artist could like figure out how to create a moment on Yelp, giving just like fire ass <laughs> views on Yelp. Like just yeah. make an audience, be funny. Like there's got, there's something there, but you have to, you have to find a digital platform. Right now, TikTok is the one but you don't have to, but you have to do something. You can't yeah. just say, man, I'm going to play my music on this bar stool and hopefully someone, something happens because I just don't think there's an A&R guy or girl in the world that is going to make their bets 100% of the time on that. Like everyone is a little data driven right now. Sure. Um, I mean that, yeah. And, and it, it's, it is, there's some tough love there. Um, and I, and I appreciate that you, uh, are saying there isn't just one way right now and that, you know, but you do have to get creative and, and it is kind of paving your own path in some capacity. And, you know, we saw two years ago, the artists that were first to the NFT craze when that was a thing and they were releasing albums with NFTs and they were doing like, you know, there were some artists that blew up in that community doing it that way that had nothing to do with TikTok. And they made, you know, I actually had one on the show, Sammy Ariaga, who made over $300,000 um, on his NFT album and he you know it's like it wasn't it like it wasn't because he had such a massive fan base he actually went into twitter spaces and busked in twitter spaces like play like <laughs> right <laughs> like you would you'd pop in and raise his hand and they'd call him up and be like all right you guys have been talking about nfts for the last hour you want to hear a song and everyone's like what yeah i'll play you a song right now i got my guitar they're like okay and then so he'd start playing and was like, and by the way, I have that song available as an NFT right now. And then everyone in that room went and bought the NFT right there in that moment. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> amazing. Oh, yeah. I, I think yeah. exactly that. You yeah. just hit the nail on the head. It doesn't need to be TikTok, but it's you got to do something. Something. Like, yeah. It's not just your guitar and a mic anymore. Like as much as I hate to say it, like, yeah, I hate that it is that now, but you have to, it's, it's showbiz, show and yeah. biz, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, totally. And that, that's great. So, so, you know, give me an example of these legacy artists that you're talking about, especially the ones that probably, you know, are hardest to come around to this. What's your approach with them when they're just like, I don't get this. I don't, my, you know, my daughter's on this app, but I don't want to be on it. What am I supposed to do here? Yeah. Um, well, I think it really comes down to uh, what their goals are. Like I, we, it's hard to talk autonomously about like every legacy artist because some of them want to lean in, you know, we don't work with them on the content side, but like, I love like Andrew Lloyd Webber's content that he comes up with. I just think it's, Whoever's working is with him. Andrew Lloyd. Oh my God. I got to check this out. I was in Jesus Christ the Superstar. <laughs> the I was in like, some of those musicals. Yeah. <laughs> it's it. Like they're just making fun of things and having a good time. Like fun. it's really fun. Um, so it really comes down to goals. Like, well, what are they doing? Are they trying to like actually do something or are yeah. they just trying to be like, hey, we're here? Yeah. Um, and, and, and to some of these legacy, like especially some of the estates. It, and mm. it's like, you have to talk to them and, and say like, look, you don't need to like adopt this platform and worry about it hundred percent of the time, but like, you kind of want to set up a store, right? Like you need to have a storefront and maybe have something going on. So it really just depends on which direction they're going to go. Um, a lot of the times it's having them understand that 
like their music is timeless and there's some cyclical kind of moments um you know like hey like your song is always going to be trending year over year so you need to like captive you know capitalize on this or understand that like this doesn't go away you know and you, it's good for you but like how do you make that moment bigger how do you capitalize how do you make sure like year over year it gets bigger or the decay period is less you know so those are some of the things that like we're talking to people about when it comes to like legacy moments Sure. Yeah. And I mean, there's no shortage of examples of songs uh, that were released 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago that have a moment, a viral moment on TikTok and then hit the charts. You know, I think uh, Fleetwood Mac song was the first of like the legacy acts that we all paid attention to. Um, I think it was Dreams. It was Dreams, right? Was that the song? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That uh, that, you know, caught because of the dude skateboarding and and then whatever and then everybody uh you know down the hill and then everyone kind of started using it and then the song started to chart again for the first time in like 50 years um and now there's no shortage of that like that's happening all the time and it's not just the old ones like you know i had ricky montgomery on the show and uh he had two songs catch that were released five years prior independently that never really had a quote unquote moment. He was working a day job at the time. He didn't even have a TikTok profile when these songs caught on TikTok. They started trending. He wasn't even on the app. And now, I mean, he is on it and he's he's brilliant at it and he's got a, a massive presence and he really leaned in uh, to the extent of like, you know, he duets people doing, uh, like using his songs or talking about his music or you know that kind of a thing um and i thought he i think he does it really well um and so yeah i mean it makes sense and and i think that's probably you know step one is like I, they probably come to you because like wait how do i do how do i get my song to chart again after 50 years or whatever mm -hmm. um but uh i mean yeah. is is there a component to any of your to like what Yo Susie does, I, I guess, because she's the most hands on, where she'll be like, where the artists will be like, can you just do this for me? Here's a boatload of money. And they're like, yeah, I'll build your whole shit and post for you if you really want. Or is that not what you guys do? That's that's almost exactly what Susie's team does for us. Okay. Uh, for she'll, go, she'll go to an artist that's like, she'll have to evaluate like how active does this artist want to be? Is it not at all? Is it a little bit or mm. is it a lot? So like there's some that like I am not going to even send you video or I'm deceased, right? So like how do you work yeah. with an artist that is deceased on right. TikTok? You've got to figure out a strategy. She's really good at that. She's worked with a lot of those estates. Or hey, there's some artists that are like, I will give you 20 minutes and that's it. So then she's thinking, okay, if I can get in front of them with an iPhone for 20 minutes or their assistant can, what do I need them to film? So the, she mm. might say, I need, I need four 30 second, just selfie clips of this. I need like two wardrobe changes that maybe she'll pop into some kind of transition moment. I need this thing of you playing a piano or sitting next to the piano. Like, so she'll be like, okay, what can I do if I have 20 minutes of their time and then figure out how to create 30 pieces of vertical content with that. Or this artist is wants to do a lot. They're very cool. So I need to work with them, send them ideas, kind of keep them up to speed. So it just depends on the artist and their cadence. Sure. That, that's really what it depends on. And then how our teams work hand in hand there is, especially this is more on the legacy moment is, mm -hmm. you know, how do we create a flywheel using creators to kind of spin off of what that legacy artist is doing with their fans on platform? Got it. Got it. Um, cool. Okay. So um, give me some examples, if you can, um, of just like newer artists, because I would imagine the majority of the people listening right now are, um, if not newer, uh, not famous legacy acts, uh, but or deceased, uh, you know, and they like, they're like, tr how do I get my TikTok strategy going? How do I make this work for me? I've been trying, uh, whatever. So talk to me about like some artists that you've worked with, uh, maybe not even newer, but like current artists that are not famous per se, that you helped go from maybe nothing to 
millions of streams on the DSPs or something like that, like a success story, I suppose, and, and just how that works with like an emerging artist. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the first thing I would say is I I never like to like ring a bell and claim credit because I've been okay. in music too long to know that like it takes a village. And more than likely, it's not one thing. It's a result of many things. But, okay. um, you know, one of the things I can I feel like I could talk about, um, there's two things that are just coming to mind. Um, there's a there's an artist, Dylan Scott, that we've done a lot of work for. He's recently had a big moment as one of the biggest songs on TikTok, on like mm -hmm. music on TikTok's biggest songs chart. Uh, he's a country artist. Um, Dylan is probably one of the hardest workers in the business that I know he's like, so hardworking. Um, but it's not a result and nothing I've ever seen has been a result, a result of like one influencer campaign or one activity. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been watching Dylan's TikTok now for like two years and we've been doing influencer campaigns for two years. This can't this this release and that release sometimes larger budgets, sometimes smaller budgets. Yeah. But it's no surprise to me that after a year and a half commitment to the platform that he has this big viral moment right now. And not just with one uh. song, but with two, you know, and I, it's a commitment to the platform. It's that he did his thing. He went after it and the label, like, you know, invested with him alongside. So I think that's one thing that I like to highlight. Um, there's another artist, uh, that I I just think the song could work really well. Um, the artist is called Snow Wife, a uh, prescription songs artist. Uh, okay. Started working it. She's got a song called American Horror Show. I think the best thing, and it's like working a little bit, like we're seeing it percolate a little bit. One thing yeah. I like about that is like she, it was started because she like posted 50 times. Like that's really good. Like that's mm. really good. You kind of understood it. You did the thing. If she didn't do it, she doesn't have an audience though, you know? Yeah. And that's where like a yeah. lot of people are like, well, I have to post 50 times. What else are you going to do? Like, fine, go pay money to build audience. Like, yeah, that's the world we live in. We live in an algorithm world. We live in a world where these social platforms are suppressing every piece of content unless it's ultra compelling or it's paid. Like, you tell me what you want to do. So, yeah. You know, I think that that's a great story. Um, and when you say she posted 50 times, is this 50 times in 50 days? Is this 50 times in 10 days? Was she posting? Like, what is the cadence now? You know, I have I heard, you know, two years ago, you know, Gary V was trending. He was like, if you're not posting seven times a day, then you're not doing it. You should go jump off a cliff. And kill yourself. You know, he didn't say that. And But it's like, basically, that's what I... How, what's the cadence right now? Yeah, I mean... You know, uh, I, I don't want to like nod my hat to Gary. I mean, I listen to Gary's podcast. I, I, I pick and choose what I love to hear from him. You know, I think he's great though. Um, but it, it, as an artist manager, like my background, it doesn't make sense to tell my artist to be filming every second of every day. Um, so like, yeah, I want to say post three to seven times a day, but that's just not where I want you to spend. If you have time to do that, I'd rather you be in the writing room writing a hit song because guess what? If you have a hit song, it's going to work on TikTok. I don't care how many times you post, right? Mm -hmm. Like figure out your art form, not like how much you should post on TikTok because if you have music that isn't great, that isn't compelling, it's just not going to work no matter if you post a hundred times a day. Yeah. So yeah. my priority, like if I'm explaining it to artists, You've got to prioritize your time as CEO of your business. Mm. Do you have the most compelling stuff that's going to work? Is it timely? I'm not saying if it's not great. I'm sure you think your music is great, but is it timely as well? Is this the time for that music? Do you have an opportunity for it? That's what you need to look at. So what is the cadence? What you feel comfortable with? But if I had to put a number on it, like you need to be posted every other day. That's probably probably the cadence if you can do a little bit more than that that's great too cool no that's super helpful um and that's and that's so important for everyone to uh remember and i appreciate that you said that said it that uh it really does it always comes down to the music and it always comes back to the music and it's like if you if the music isn't there 
uh, it doesn't matter how good your TikTok is. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just not going to work. And that's like, you know, you can't, what you can't polish a turd, they say you can't put lipstick on a pig or whatever the cliche is. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, um, but there's something to be said, because I think we could all, I appreciate that sentiment. I think every artist who's listening to this appreciates that sentiment. But then I could also point to a bunch of examples of artists, of, of creators, or, you know, call them artists, I guess, who I don't think their music's that great, but gosh darn it, they caught on TikTok. And you know what? The 15 seconds caught. And now they have 20 million streams on a song that is frankly kind of shit. But what do you say to that? <laughs> yeah, there's nothing you could say, you know? It's, it's terrible, man. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. Right, but, right. And man, I just... You know, I, I applaud artists right now that are really committed to their craft. It is yeah. not an easy world right now. Yeah. It is chaos. It is difficult. It's infuriating, frustrating. You know, you spend 20 years of your life playing guitar, figuring out how to write songs. You think they're perfect. And then someone's song on TikTok takes off as they're like blowing bubble gum or something and just hearing, <laughs> bubble, you know, I don't know, something yeah, stupid yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and gets a big record deal. And you're like what right yep. it's it's just a it's rotten right now yep 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 well i appreciate the acknowledgement uh <laughs> the, the the struggle that all the artists um are going through right now and and it is real um and you know i talk with artists every day that are just trying to figure it out um but uh but yeah this is uh you know johnny this has been so illuminating i really appreciate kind of um you being kind of as as open and, and transparent um, with me on this, uh, I uh, I have one final question that I ask everybody who comes on the show, and that is, uh, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? Yeah, um, I saw that man, and I was like, okay, because I was listening to all your podcasts, and I was like, yeah. he asks this every time. Yeah. I love it. Um, so, what does it mean to me to make it in the new music business? Um, and that, for me personally, has changed over the years. Um, and especially as an entrepreneur, I'm just forever in this cycle of like, there's no destination, there's only a journey kind of thing, because I just don't know. Uh, but man, when I feel like my happiness, my happiest is when, as I'm working, I'm working with like my friends, my homies, like people that I really like, and we're just like getting wins together. To me, that is because it's it's an industry that like, that's why you're in it or at least that's why I'm in it. Like I could go sell cars or like go sure. work on widgets, right? Somewhere. But like, I just want to like do cool shit with my friends. And so I just feel most happy. I feel like I've made it when I'm high-fiving with my friends or people that I think are really awesome. And we, you know, share a lot of community together. So that's when I feel like I've made it. Those Amazing. Thanks, Johnny. That was awesome. Yeah. Cool. Definitely, Ari. We'll talk soon, man. Today's episode was edited by Maxton Hunter, theme music by Brassroots District, and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.